Many physical systems in real life can be described by a linear, causal, and time invariant model. Examples include simple mechanical systems like springs and dampers, which follow linear behavior over a certain range of displacement according to Hooke's law, or linear electrical circuits consisting of resistors, capacitors, and inductors, which follow relationships as described by Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's laws, and the linear differential equations that govern their behavior. In audio engineering, concepts of linear systems are also often used to model the behavior of components, such as amplifiers and filters. Let me first define what is a linear, time-invariant causal system. A system is linear if and only if it satisfies the superposition principle, which means that a linear combination of inputs FT to the system produces a linear combination of the individual outputs GT. A system is time-invariant if a time delay of the input merely equates to a time delay of the output. In other words, the response of the system does not change with time. For a causal system, the impulse response of the system must only rely on the present and past values of the input to determine the output. This requirement is a necessary and sufficient condition for causality. Let me first spell out the key conceptual ideas we will discuss in this video. First, we review the well-known convolution formula that describes a causal linear system where the output GT can be constructed by the convolution of the input function and the impulse response of the system. We will explain why such convolution formula indeed respect linearity, causality, and time invariance. Next, we derive the generalized response function. We also take this chance to clarify the different conventions for Fourier transformation. We prove this elegant relation, that the output is given by the product of the generalized response function with the input. Finally, we prove that the generalized response function is analytic over one half of the complex frequency plane. Part 1. Linear Time Invariant Causal System Why Convolution? We are interested in the model for a linear, time invariant and causal system, or LTC system for short. That is quite a mouthful, and we shall explain what they means. First off, let's denote the input to our system as FT and output as GT. In what follows, we shall show that the behavior of the output GT of a LTC system can be mathematically described by the convolution of the input FT with the impulse response of the system herein denoted as chi multiplies by the step function u. It's straightforward to see why chi is called the impulse response. Let the input ft be the impulse function. Then we see the output gt in response to the impulse function precisely yields the function chi multiplies by the step function, which is why it is aptly called the impulse response. As such, chi must then be a real function as required for any physical measurable impulse response. Having established that chi is the response function of the system, how can we intuitively understand why the output gt would be given by the convolution of f with chi, as shown? Given a general input f of t, we can always deconstruct it in terms of discrete sum of impulse functions, whose weights at each infinitesimal time step is given by its corresponding f value at that time step. By virtue that we are dealing with a linear systems, its output GT would then also be a superposition of the impulse responses, with each responses produced at different time steps. Taking the continuous limit in time, we can write the discrete sum as integral, which indeed yields us the convolution formula for linear system. Using the commutivity property, then we can rewrite the convolution expression in our original form as highlighted in blue. Thus, one sees why the convolution formula is a natural result of the very definition of a linear system. Next, let's briefly comment about the second property of our LTC system, namely time invariance. We see that if the input is time shifted by t naught, the output gt would also be rigidly time shifted by the same amount. In other words, you would see the same response no matter when you perform the measurement. At this juncture, we should mention that there are other equivalent forms to writing the response of our LTC system. To make transparent the inherent causality in our model, it will be helpful to ascribe another time variable for the input EF by letting T prime equals to T minus tau. By exploiting the step function to reduce the integration limits and also a change of integration variable from tau to T prime, one can arrive at an equivalent expression for GT. It is immediately apparent that gt has to be zero when t is less than t prime. In other words, there cannot be any output response before any input. This is the mathematical embodiment of causality. 
This alternative form for our LTC system was obtained assuming time invariance. In the absence of time invariance, or in other words the system varies with time, then the response function can be described by the following general form. In this video we are only interested in the time invariance case and will use the following response model in what follows. Part 2. Fourier transform and the generalized response function. We begin with the response function for our LTC system. Many of you might have learned before that the Fourier transform of a convolution of two functions is the pointwise product of their Fourier transforms. If not, no worries. We will do a quick refresher in a minute. Here in this video, we denote the Fourier transformed functions with a tilde and their Fourier transformed pairs are defined as follows. We note, however, there are alternatives definitions of the Fourier transform pairs. Common in physics, the sign of the exponent in the Fourier kernel is flipped. We call this the physics convention. A more symmetrical definition of Fourier transform pairs was used in our quantum mechanics videos, which was more appropriate because of its norm-conserving properties. In this video, we will be using the engineering convention, which is also the convention implemented in the popular scientific programming tool MATLAB. You can find tables of common Fourier transform pairs for these conventions at Wikipedia. Now, we are ready to perform the Fourier transformation. First, we substitute the GT and FT functions with their Fourier transform relations, expressed in terms of G tilde and F tilde omega. Here we define the variable T prime to be T minus tau. Next, on the right-hand side, we split the exponential kernel into two pieces, exponential I omega T and exponential I omega tau. This then allows us to recognize the integrand as highlighted, which must equal one another. The highlighted term is the Fourier transform of chi times the step function. Thus, we arrived at the well-known result that the output g tilde omega equals to chi tilde omega times f tilde omega. Here, chi tilde omega is known as the generalized response function. It's worth repeating again. In the Fourier domain, the output function g tilde is just the product of the generalized response function chi tilde and the input function f tilde. Part 3. Causal response function is analytic over upper or lower half omega plane. Now we are ready to prove that the generalized response function chi tilde is an analytic function. We shall exploit the step function ut and perform integration only for positive tau. We note that this step is crucial for the function to be analytic. Recall, ut is also crucial for ensuring causality as discussed in previous chapter. We should also emphasize that the generalized response is not equal to the Fourier transform of chi, but it is the product of chi and the step function instead. Next, we can make use of Euler identity and write the complex exponential in terms of sine and cosine functions. We remind you that the response function chi has to be real, since it is the impulse response. As such, the two integrals are purely real and can be associated with the real and imaginary part of the generalized response function. Due to their cosine and sine dependence, the real and imaginary part are even in odd functions with respect to omega, respectively. From an electrical circuit analogy, the real part is like the resistor which produces an in-phase response, while the imaginary part is a reactive one producing an out-of-phase response. We can further generalize our result for complex omega, where omega r and omega i denotes the real and imaginary part, respectively. We can check that the symmetry relations holds with respect to omega r. Okay, so we have established that the generalized response function can be written in its real and imaginary part as follows. We want to prove that chi tilde is an analytic function over one half of the complex omega plane. The cauchy riemann relations must be satisfied for this to be true, which requires the derivative of the real and imaginary part of chi tilde with respect to omega r or omega i to satisfy the equalities as shown. Note that one can also interchange the omega i and omega r. Let's work these out one by one. First, the derivative of chi tilde r with respect to omega r. Next, the derivative of chi tilde r with respect to omega i. Next, the derivative of chi tilde i with respect to omega i. And lastly, the derivative of chi tilde i with respect to omega r. For these integrals to be convergent, we need omega i to be positive. With this, it is easy to check that the cauchy riemann relations for the generalized response function is exactly satisfied. 
Thus, we have shown that the generalized response function is indeed analytic in the upper half of the omega complex plane, where omega i is positive. Note that we have derived this result with our choice of the engineering convention and Fourier transform. If we had chosen the physics Fourier transform convention instead, then omega i would have to be negative for the generalized response function to be analytic. These conventions are also known as time conventions in the literature and can often be a source of confusion. To summarize, we discussed the governing equations for such a linear causal and time invariant system, which relates the input and output functions in the time and frequency domain. We discussed the physical intuition why the time domain output response is described by convolution of the input function and the system impulse response. We derived the elegant frequency domain response via Fourier transformation. Lastly, we proved that the generalized response function must be analytic over the upper or lower half complex frequency plane. Stay tuned for future videos. More videos on linear response theory are in the works and will be posted in the next week or two. So please check out this playlist on linear response theory.